Yeah. Chairman, you have a problem? It's, it's not me, it's the machine that tells you what's happening. They call, they call to order, and if we can start off with a roll call. Alderman Boyd, not present. Alderman Cohn, not present. Commissioner Banton, present. Commissioner Boaz, not present. Commissioner Bradley, present. Commissioner Brown, present. Commissioner Peoples, present. Commissioner Reese, Commissioner Vines, present. Commissioner Young, Ms. Young is here. And Chair Strother, present. And you do you have a quorum. So oh, sorry. Took me five minutes to come apart. Should have just parked at City Hall. All right. <laughs> With that, we now have a quorum, and we have Commissioner Boyd who has answered roll. Uh, the first order of business is approval of our minutes for November. So we'll move. I have a second. I have a moving second. We can have a roll call to approve minutes. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Commissioner Banton. Aye. Commissioner Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Peoples. Aye. Commissioner Vines. Aye. Commissioner Young. Aye. Chair Strother. No, abstain. 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 Motion passes with seven ayes and one abstention. All right, thank you for that. Let me first thank Randy for filling in last month. As I hear you did a wonderful job. You know, when you do a wonderful job, the seat's always available to you. <laughs> uh, with that, we've got two major items, two public hearings on the agenda. One is uh, Clinton Park, and the other one is downtown transportation. Uh, we will kind of change the agenda as we're going to do the action later. We're going to have the action after the presentation, and Don will be the result of this. And at the moment, Don, I'll show you that you can get two minutes. We'll extend it to the four items. item. Per item. Um, <laughs> let me catch my talk really fast. I'm fast on my end. Um, well, welcome everybody tonight. But, so we are doing items that include a public hearing. Uh, we're in this room, uh, so it's intimate and fun, and you guys will have a discussion. As we said, we're going to ask you to vote after the public hearing tonight. Both items that you'll hear are items that we're quite comfortable and have had extensive community input and stakeholder input. Uh, and so, therefore, the public hearing, I don't think, would be particularly sensitive. Stop. Has everybody signed in that wants to speak to the public hearing? Please be sure you do so at this time. Thank you. And this young lady here will give you the form of the Thank you. 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 That uh, we'll be adopting under the topical plan variety. That means the, the plans, official plans of the city of St. Louis. Uh, and in this case, they're not neighborhood plans, uh, they have a special topic. So the first one up tonight is Clifton Heights Park Plan. Uh, I'm a resident of Clifton Heights, I live along the park. Uh, so this has been an exciting opportunity to, to have the plan. Uh, these both will be plans that have been commissioned by other parts of city government uh, and overseen by DPS. Uh, but with this first one, uh, we'll have the consultant come up and make a presentation. Uh, that will be Ted Spade. And Don, am I ready to get to that uh, presentation? You want me to do be the slide master? Hi. Happy to. I'm not talking. <laughs> We go. <laughs> well, I'll introduce myself first. Again, my name is Ted Spade. I'm a landscape architect and planner for uh, SWP Design. We were the lead firm that was hired. Uh, I'm also, when I moved to St. Louis, I moved in the Clifton Heights on uh, Clifton back in 1977, so I know the park well. Uh, we decided to have the opportunity uh, to work on this. And 
my, uh, my uh, business is founded in Parks and Recreation uh, planning, so uh, it's good to have the opportunity to do this. Um, we have uh, Scott Ogilvy here and Mara, who seems to be getting bigger, <laughs> who uh, was very involved in uh, kind of helping to spearhead and, and lead this effort uh, very early on. Whose guy is over Clifton Park tonight? <laughs> your, your one other quality you forgot to mention here in the long end of the uh, I've I, I been 10 years on the planning commission. <laughs> so, I never said a word. You could behave well during the entire 10 years. I can see it here. Find me. Great hands on his team. 
Um, we certainly have Rick Bradley and his team at the Board of Public Services that have been involved, the Mayor's Office, and the City of Alderman, uh, all the ages, they're very involved in the two next slide. Uh, so, I just want to make sure we acknowledge that. Actually, the book that you have in front of you did have uh, some uh, folks missing in there, but we really involved uh, a whole bunch of people that uh, make the master plan uh, work. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, some of you that uh, may or may not be familiar with uh, what the Ice nice Park is, uh, it's just to the west of Jackson Avenue, and it's founded by uh, Interstate 44 and Arsenal. And it's really quite a lovely space. It's uh, uh, a neighborhood park. Uh, it's kind of broken into two sections, but it's roughly seven acres in size. Uh, on the north side, there's about 4.9 acres, and then there's a road that divides the other two point. Uh, four acres. So it's very much a, a park like community. It's a very loved park. Uh, one of the things that we do as part of the master plan is really work with stakeholders to really evaluate the existing conditions and where do we go from there. So within your book, there's a lot more analysis. Um, that's kind of hit on a real high level. Do my go to the next slide. I think I'm going to inject something. I, I, I expect you to. So actually, I live on this park. Uh, but one of the things that's unique about seeing this in this view is it's one of the few city parks that's really not just in the rectangular grid. So that you can see in part of this, it's certainly not in the rectangular grid. The result of that is there's not major traffic going on either sides of the park. If you're in that area where it's curvy, you're in there because you're going to the park, or you're coming to see me. Uh, for one of our partners. Okay. Uh, there's actually a lot of photography. So as part of the process, as Don mentioned very early on, there was a very much a robust public uh, process. Uh, we had uh, originally a public engagement meeting uh, just to ask the community, what do they want? What's, what's really important uh, to the community uh, here? And part of that is, wasn't just having like a town hall meeting, but it was actually going and engaging them in the park, uh, the community at a party in the park, uh, we made sure that we had a survey that was put out to again assess, you know, are we hearing things right? Are we are we finding out the key things that the community would like out of that? So we had a survey, and then we eventually had public meeting number two, which we rolled out the design uh, and asked for feedback at the second meeting. And so really, uh, the master plan was completed probably March of this year. And so we're here asking for your confirmation of the master plan, as uh, Don had mentioned, as, as an overlay uh, to adopt the master plan. So what I want to do is take you through uh, that process a little bit more. As part of that community engagement was getting out to know the people in the park, finding out how they use it, uh, everything from active recreation, playgrounds to the south side, to kind of open areas where people just play ad hoc, basketball and soccer. Uh, and this is party. So there's a lot of beloved things that occur on an annual basis uh, within Clifton Park, uh, including ice skating, right now. But you're not going to do on the way. So really, three major tenets came out of this master plan. I think it's really important to have a real solid foundation. One of us, number one was really to repair the park. Uh, you know, it has great bones, and so it is really important to the community that we repair the assets that we have and pay attention to those things. The second was to restore the character of the park. Uh, as you know, time goes by, and you can you can blink, and 20 years can go by, right? To be that are older, and and things get in a state of disrepair, uh, and things aren't quite right. Like trees get plucked down in the ground, and next thing you know, you your below the open space has trees in the middle of it. So things happen, and so it's important to have a master plan that thinks about that and restores the park. And then lastly, was improving the functionality of the park. We'll talk more about those three things. Uh, basically, when you think about the park in, in its seven acres, is there are these major components: the entrances to the park, the community green, what we're referring to as the hub in the middle of the main portion of the park, the close and basin, and then the main play area. So, what I want to do is walk you through uh, the design uh, of that. <coughs> the overall master plan is kind of seen in all these. I'm not going to go through all these components, but actually just dive right into the next slide. Uh, the very west end of the park uh, was was really one of the main pedestrian entrances. One of the things that we found out with the other is 
Uh, there, there aren't anything out there to create traffic calming. It's pretty much people can really, you know, use the the, the, the roads around there almost like a little racetrack. And, and so it's very important to create some traffic calming and create cues for pedestrians. So this was an area that we suggested uh, putting in crosswalks, putting in uh, an identity sign at this point, having seating and really welcoming people and giving kind of a formal entrance, if you will, uh, into the park itself. And, these documents begin to show uh, what we see in the master plan that are important. Thinking about things like even the wrought iron, there's some existing wrought iron out there now, and can we replicate some of those elements to, to give that, that robust uh, uh, flavor of the park. The next is the hub. The hub was an interesting area. If any of you have been out there, you know, it, it, it looks and smells and feels like the 1970s. I mean, it, it has old concrete structures that, that you know, uh, is, is kind of what used to be the spray ground, the version of a spray ground, and probably in the 70s that was pretty cool stuff. Uh, but it's very dated. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with this hub was to improve the spray ground, create uh, something that is more accessible and safe for children. But at the same time, this is kind of a low portion of the park, so we're looking at having rain gardens, having nice seating areas, really bringing people to that portion of the park in a real lovely way. So these images are, are supporting what we envision uh, this portion of the park uh, to be. Then the basin itself, uh, which is really kind of the, the, the icon, if you will, within, within the, the park itself, uh, has, a, has a lot of opportunity to restore. And using some of our contemporary thinking about how do we deal with water bodies today, uh, right now it's pretty much a concrete basin uh, with, with a uh, dirt bottom. Uh, and how can we make improvements to that? And so one of the things that we're looking at is adding in aquatic plant material that will help with uh, dealing with uh, nitrogen uptake, so making a little bit more environmentally of, uh, of a closed uh, loop. Uh, adding uh, fountains in this area. But I think the only thing I'm really excited about, and I think the community is excited about too, is how can we restore the old boat house and restaurants in this area? And right now, the upper picture is what it looks like today. Uh, it's a functioning restroom now, but it looks like it's almost boarded up, you know? And so they want it to really be a little bit more activated, uh, get some visual cues that safe place to come down to. And so we created this outdoor uh, closet seating area and some restoration to the restroom to help interject natural light um, and just create that a nice safe space to be at, at the closet the itself. And then lastly, uh, there's another entrance to the park on the east side. We want to make sure that we have good ADA accessibility into the park. Uh, again, nice place to sit uh, in this location as well. So this is, a, I think, a, a real opportunity to kind of give it a, a freshen up as we think about using the existing assets. <coughs> then the last kind of main area uh, is the playground itself to the south. This is where there's a lot of photography in this area. Again, people kind of really whip around this corner. And so it was really important to a lot of the families uh, there is to create a much safer walk. And one of the ways that we suggest creating that safety is having a raised crosswalk in the roadway to help with kind of that traffic calming in there. Uh, another way was to take the existing playground area and fence it in with a little fence so that when kids are playing, you know, we don't want them running across the road going over the other side of the park. It gives, you know, when there's a party there, there's young families there, it gives kind of a, a moms and dads a little peace of mind by having that little extra barrier uh, with the fence. The other one, the other kind of number one item, probably number two, number one item was to have a, a pavilion out there. Right now there's no shade structure pavilion. A lot of people come here for uh, family gatherings and for uh, birthday parties. And so we have suggested doing a open air shelter, very simple, a couple of picnic tables. But that would kind of be the center node that would bridge the playground side to the multi-purpose port and some of the restoration there. So we think this is a project unto itself that it, it, it really freshens up and builds upon the existing assets that are there now. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the lake. Uh, we wanted to make sure we worked with the Parks Department, the Board of Public Service to understand how all that was built, where we worked with a number of folks uh, uh, with the Water Division to make sure that uh, we have plenty of, uh, we've identified projects in terms of restoring 
uh, the walls and the pond walls, uh, as well as some of the improvements that need to be made here. So in your report, you'll see there's a little bit more in depth dive and how we might uh, deal with improving the infrastructure here. Uh, lighting was another major component in the park. Right now, as you know, many of our parks just have cobra head lights just kind of meandering throughout the park. And uh, this, there's all, all the community, there's a lot of eyes on this park, and it is used uh, quite a bit. And so having it safe and secure, and also think about dark sky initiatives. So right now, a lot of those cobra head lights, they blast a lot of light, and there's a lot of light pollution. So one of our uh, suggestions were to use more of a short pedestrian pole that would be a LED light that would really just cast the light on the ground and not create a lot of spillover. So this is another one of our recommendations to uh, help with safety and security and branding the identity of the park itself. Um, and the other thing is, you know, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was understanding the history and the beauty of the Clifton Heights neighborhood. Uh, we wanted to think about that branding and identity, and one of the ways that we can do that is having timeless um, park furnishings. Uh, and so things like, you know, having uh, wrought iron benches, you know, strap iron benches and receptacles, things that are durable, that are sustainable, uh, but also meet the genre and the, and the design kind of uh, intent of the Clifton Heights neighborhood. So it was important for us to think about the branding and identity and, and how some of that is uh, done. So with this master plan that gives the Parks Department uh, a standard, if you will, uh, that would be dedicated uh, to Clifton Heights Park. So, as you can tell, we kind of broke these into all these different bite-sized pieces. It was important to make sure that we just didn't have this big master plan with a big price tag. It's like, how can we break this down into bite-sized pieces that can be done over time? The idea of any kind of Parks Master Plan is it has a shelf life between 10 to 15 years. And, and the idea is that you can implement projects over time. So what we did is we created uh, a series of priorities that we heard from the community. Um, number one, kind of at the top was the restrooms and bunk house improvements, uh, making sure that those are safe. The open air shelter and the fence, the playground is a high priority, <coughs> improving the lighting. And from there on, they became maybe a little bit more uh, obscure. But those three uh, areas were pretty key uh, to the community. So what we did is, in the report that you see before you, uh, there's a fairly detailed cost estimate that breaks it into these uh, bite-sized pieces that can be done over time, as well as kind of raising money for, for these activities. So, Pretty much that's in a nutshell. We, we uh, I think the community had a good time kind of going through this process, and uh, we uh, asked for the uh, planning board's uh, adoption of this master plan. Thank you, Tim. Any want to do the public hearing first, and then come back for questions? No, go ahead and have questions. Okay. Any questions from the commission first? So what is in, what is the area of the community that you solicited feedback for? for this? Is it just the like small area directly surrounding the park, or is it this entire? No, it's a whole town. That whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, a, a raised crosswalk. How is that different from a speed hump? Yeah, I think the difference between them is the speed hump doesn't necessarily have a crosswalk. In it. Right. Uh, so this is a raised table that has a crosswalk. So there is a, a kind of a hybrid of a crosswalk and a speed table. Is it about the same height? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the same height. Do they exist in Forest Park? Yes. There's quite a few in Forest Park. I don't get a chance to go to Forest Park often. I don't have leisure time. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, the, the creative word light pollution, that was kind of a neat little word. I, when I think of the um, the old fixtures, they do light up. One of the complaints I get from my constituents is the, the nice LED lights that shine right. a lot of light down in the street, so it illuminates the street very well, but they miss the sidewalk. If they tend to put out, they illuminate more to me than the LED, nice, bright, white lights. So how does that make it 
safer in a park? Well, there's a couple of things. One is when you have what I call open globe fixtures, mm -hmm. they create a lot of glare. So um, if you have, if, if, there, if, if, if he's the light, you know, and, and Patrick <laughs> is a guy I don't want to run into, mm -hmm. that light would be it was in your face. And so it's hard to have what's called facial recognition mm -hmm. of that person that might be coming at you. And so whenever you have, that's why dark sky compliant and LED lighting, uh, when you have that type of light distribution, it's better from a facial recognition standpoint. Okay. Um, so even though it's, it's the perception, everything feels a lot brighter when you have those big open globe fixtures or, or, or the, the old style fixtures, mm -hmm. the perception is, Everything's brighter. Well, it is, but it's there's there's a kind of a uh, there's been a lot of studies done on that 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 show that that is kind of a more dangerous light to have, if you will. Hmm. And so the design community is moving towards this type of lighting system. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, the, uh, what is the distance in that the diameter of the Park. What's the distance around? I don't know. I, I, I missed a walking trail or something. Yeah. I'm surprised I didn't see a walking trail well, or something in there. We, we brought that. Half we, you know, how much is it? The street. It's about half street, mile. Just shy of it. Okay. Well, that's a nice so we, we talked about that, and, and there's a lot of sidewalks in that portion of the community, but what happens is the, the park is such a bowl, it, it, it really, the, the topo goes way down pretty quickly. Uh, and so we thought that adding a sidewalk path of, around the uh, park uh, was redundant in a way, uh, and also uh, just adds more walkways than necessary. Okay. It's a neat plan. I've only seen it once or twice, once at night and once during the day. But it is a neat park. You guys did a good job on that. Mr. Chairman, we have three people signed up. Okay. Really, what's your really proposal for construction time? How long it in your proposed? Plan? Well, we're not. We we don't have a a timeline for construction. It's more about how the funding becomes available. Uh, you, the height of the master plan is it's kind of like it's kind of like shovel ready, right? If 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 you have projects that are ready to roll out, so then enrich and and. Uh, um, Greg Hayes have funding available, they'll pick these projects off as, as a okay. So Alderman, we'll give you the option if you want to go first or last in the speakers. Yeah. Uh, I go first. Um, so, do we, do this is not a particularly big part, but I thought it deserves a master plan because there's a lot going on within the route between Fall Mount City. Um, and there's a, there's a city street dividing the park into two parts. Um, I think there are there are lots of areas where you could uh, spend money, and certainly I thought about spending money in different ways uh, in this park. But I thought before doing a lot of sort of one-off projects, it would be worth doing a master plan so that as flex projects are carried out over time, you have a consistent limitation of something that was hopefully bigger than the other park. Um, it's definitely an important park in the neighborhood that really defines the character of a lot of the surrounding community. So I think you don't want to do the wrong thing in this park. Uh, people would certainly know it. Um, and I think there, I think well, it's, it's a well used and well appreciated park that has a lot of uh, community involvement right now. I think there's definitely um, areas that could be substantially enhanced. Uh, and I think in particular that connection between the playground area and the rest of the park. Um, could you know doing something there, and, and that's the type of that 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 might be something that if we just left it to you know the alderman to think up the project, the execution of something like connecting the playground to the other side of the park would probably uh, not rise to the level that it could rise to. So having this master plan plan as a framework um, to to guide investments and having something on paper now that that residents have an opportunity to digest and respond to as implementation happens, I think it's just very valuable. And in a decade, I think we'll have, uh, we have a good park now, and I think we'll have an even better park a decade from now with, with the master plan. And at least I try to emphasize over the course of time when we talked about this, that uh, the master plan is a plan, but implementation will depend on 
I think the engagement between an all good and park department and neighborhood to figure out what's prioritized, you know, when funding is available, what to do first, and, and what to you know, wait a couple of weeks on the line to do. But I do think that this would, this would be a very valuable guide for going forward. So that's my spiel. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Before we do that, but, uh, can we have a motion to open the public forum? Second. Okay. Do we need to vote for that? Yes. Okay. Well, the man votes. Aye. Uh, sir, uh, sorry, Commissioner Benton. Aye. Mr. Bradley. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Peoples. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Chair Strouser. Aye. Passes the fall voting on. Okay. With that, the public forum is now open. We have uh, some guests that would like to speak. Um, can you give us the first person, if you would? We do ask that you maintain your conversation to literally about two or three minutes on this one. None of them are relatives of mine. No, so okay. just be efficient. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to keep them on track with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have Doug um, I'm a resident of Clifton Heights, Doug Burge, and huge shout out to Scott and Charles Prince with this. I'm also a member of the Clifton Heights Neighborhood Association and Friends of Clifton Park, which are both volunteer organizations that are devoted to the neighborhood and specifically to the park. And we worked with Scott to get this going. Um, our neighborhood pretty much revolves, I mean, if you look at that the aerial, we kind of orbit around that park, that's the center of our neighborhood, and there's a lot of interest in making this happen. I, I think it's a good plan. Um, you know, one of my concerns is, and we're going to remain involved with the volunteers, my concern is it's another plan that's just going to be made, and then it's just going to kind of fade away. And we really don't want that to happen. So I want to reinforce to the group that we have a lot of people in the neighborhood that are devoted to the park and to the improvements to the park. And I want to make sure we remain some kind of engagement. I don't know what that consists of. I mean, obviously, work with our aldermen and other people, but I want it known to the wider body that we really want to make some of these things happen. So I really appreciate the city putting this together, Scott's improvement, our additions, and all that. So it's more common sense. So. Everybody you see lined up against the wall or been out there on Saturday or Sunday or helping and doing things. Yeah, it's just out there at our neighbor Steve here. They're out there doing some weeding and planting and other things in some of the areas there. I think we really want to do a lot of sweat equity in this park. We got, oh, so it's December 15th. Candy cane hunt for kids. <laughs> if anyone who's my kids is 10 years old, we're going to have Santa Claus there and run out and pick up the candy cane. So. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Next one is Steve Kevin. Yes, Steve Kevin. I live on uh, Hoffman Avenue in Clifton Heights. I've been involved, uh, uh, I guess, for about 14 years or so on a pretty active basis in the park. Uh, before I get into that spiel, uh, anybody know the, name the, uh, the name of Julius Pitsman? Yeah, a lot of you guys do, I know. This is a Pittsman neighborhood. That's a big deal to us. He recognized that when they laid that neighborhood out, that there was a, the park is a sinkhole, okay? It's, it's a sinkhole. That's, it's a karst, okay, to be a little more formal about it. But you know, that's it. He said, let's, you know, you got the tracks down at the bottom in the, uh, the 1880s. We want to keep the, uh, this kind of a pastoral, uh, residential area. We don't want wagons coming off of, at that time, Southwest Avenue was Old Manchester Road, so you didn't want them coming down there. So the idea was, this is the first, Dan, you could probably correct me on this, but this is one of the first times in urban planning that people actually took into consideration the existing landscape. And I work with Ted, and I'm a landscape contractor, so this is a big damn deal. I think this is a, a very significant part of this thing that someone actually recognized the environment, you know, well over 100 years ago and, and made it work. So it's curvilinear. You can tell if you look at the aerials of St. Louis, you can tell the Pittsburgh neighborhood because the streets are all curvilinear. It's a very unique, you know, thing. Uh, Longfellow, Hawthorne, uh, or over by Forest Park and some of those. But anyway, our park has that, you know, the, the curved streets. It's pretty unique. But 
again, uh, what Doug said about this, we want this to be a working plan. I think we could go to the city archives and find lots of plans. I have inherited from neighbors several plans from the 60s, the 70s, and 80s, and different uh, renditions of part, things that never came to fruition. And some of them I'm kind of glad they did. But you know, they, with a city budget, that's fine. I mean, we're all sometimes we got to buy trash trucks. You know, that's that's the priority, and, and we all we all know that. That's, that's where we are. You know, we have an infrastructure built for 800,000 people, and we don't have it anymore. That's the reality. So there's an economic reality here. So that's as a group, we're looking at potentially outdoor, you know, uh, other funding. There's grants, there's things that we as a not-for-profit in the neighborhood could do to keep this thing forward. We're, our job is stewards of the neighborhood. We want to see this thing two or three generations down, just as cool as it is now, but just, you know, you got to fix things occasionally, and that's, that's really what this is about. Just moving it into the 21st century as a 19th century public space, but let's, it's a great space. It's a very unique, I mean, uh, I could go on forever, and you, know, you catch me on a Saturday, and I probably will. But you know, again, we we appreciate everything you're doing here. Uh, but uh, we want to keep working on this. That's that's why we kind of initiated this with, with Ms. Rosemary's help, and uh, we 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 want this to be a working plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, all public state comments have been made. I have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. The move is seconded. Call the previous roll. Any objections? Hearing no objections, it's approved to close the public meeting with previous roll. Uh, the next item of action is the actual action, the action item on this. Uh, so I'm going to ask you that we uh, adopt this as a topical plan for the Clifton Park and the Clifton Heights neighborhood. Uh, you've heard multiple things about it. I, I do encourage you, uh, uh, as you're out and about in the city, to go and, and visit this. this this neighborhood in particular in this park uh, as a specific character building item. So uh, we've done this presentation. I want to tell you that there was a public comment uh, period to, prior to this. We advertised it. Like I said, the, most of the items that we come and we have public hearings in this room is because there's been much out, outreach as part of the whole process itself. This is no exception to that rule. Uh, but comments were solicited through the web and also at the local library. Uh, we did not receive any through that me method, uh, so we do uh, recommend that we go ahead and vote on it and approve it tonight as you've seen it uh, in presentation. Uh, we will remind ourselves that when we look at this in the terms of the strategic land use plan, it's that amoeba-shaped thing in the middle of it that's recognized on the strategic land use plan as a park uh, with uh, single-family um, stable neighborhood preservation around it. So it's in accordance to the, the general uh, plan of the sloop, uh, and therefore we've reviewed it. We've heard comments. We recommend the plan as a good document to guide the future development of Clifton Heights Park. And we want to tell you that we see it and recommend that it is conformity with the strategic land use plan, and we recommend to you, the Planning Commission, that you adopt it as a topical plan. Thank you. Uh, Kind of budget the, the park has, so, you know, an, annually the park funds mm -hmm. made available. What type of budget does this one have? Uh, well, I mean, in the past, because there's not going to match, I mean, sort of look at that on a like repair by repair right. basis. Um, and so I think we, we have been repaired this year. We replaced the playground and we replaced the basketball court. Did some exterior work. Um, you know, each of those is a fifty or hundred thousand dollar range. I, because we have dedicated um, sales tax benefits, <laughs> because we have dedicated uh, streams of sales tax revenue uh, for for parks, I think if, if you were to budget. Um, Maybe on like a two-year basis, the budget like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars across those two years. Uh, you could you could check up the box in those a decade or so, yeah. um, and, and probably execute most of them. Keeping in mind that each one of those aspects of the plan still has to be supposed to be designed to be designed. 
executed. But I think I think it's very reasonable to see the think a million to a million and a half in DNA over ten years. Um, and that would be um, it's feasible with the city's budget and I think it's feasible with the average. Any other questions prior to? With that, approval. Second in for approval. Call for a vote. Alderman Boyd? Aye. Commissioner Bannon? Aye. Mr. Bradley? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Peoples? Aye. Commissioner Ryan? Aye. Commissioner Young? Aye. Chair Strong? Aye. And motion passes with all present voting? Aye. Very good. Plan has been accepted. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Yep. And to you, if you want to come sit back to the chair. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, all of you, for that. Thank you for the your input. Any expected participants at the candy cane hunt coming up? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you said a Santa Claus to get you, Don. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that, uh, Don will begin with the present next presentation on the downtown St. Louis transportation study and that. Yeah, so this uh, kind of excited about this plan. Uh, the other one was in my own neighborhood, passionate and caring about it. Trans uh, <laughs> qualification is they weren't excited about this plan. Yeah, uh, no. uh, my wife hosted the Easter egg hunt for almost a dozen years. And, uh, uh, but downtown, remember, downtown has an adopted neighborhood plan in it. Uh, and downtown has undergone some changes, but also understandably there are some things that improve over time and some zeroing in on things. So this is a plan to zero in on resolving some transportation concerns and issues uh, for the downtown area, uh, which includes the multiple neighborhoods that we have down there. Again, uh, they asked you uh, the that uh, this has been through a number of stakeholder type events with downtown uh, that we have a presentation by the consultant that was under contract to do this with TPS uh, and then uh, also have a vote on it tonight. So we're going to do the presentation uh, with uh, I'm pushing the button and the profit button right on transportation doing the presentation with Jackie. I think you're doing the Presentation. Uh, you standing okay? Yeah. Okay. And you want to introduce uh, the rest of your team? Yeah. So uh, my name is Jackie Lumpson. I'm a transportation planner with CBB. We're a local transportation um, engineering and planning firm. And Sean Light is the vice president at CBB. And um, him and I really ran with this project um, for our firm. So. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, we're super excited to be here and talk about this plan. Um, you know, we're really excited about it. It was great to work with the Board of Public Service on this effort. Um, so, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about the um, engagement and the planning process so you can understand how we reach out to people. Um, and then I'll get into some of the major recommendations, which includes the hierarchy of streets that um, you'll see discussed in the, the plan that you have on the table, um, and then also some immediate opportunities. Um, just so you know a little bit about the larger effort, this is one element of a congestion mitigation air quality project that was awarded to the city of St. Louis. Um, it was actually in phase three, so there's been two previous phases. This component included some network design and construction, staffing of the traffic management center, and then the downtown multi multimodal plan, which I'm going to talk about right now, um, also a downtown signal event. So these are the project limits. Um, so we went to CAS on the north, SHOTO on the south. The reason for those limits is we wanted to um, capture neighborhoods <coughs> north of downtown, also understanding where the NGA is going to be located. Shuttle on the south was really important to get across the railroad barrier and connect residents from South City into downtown. 
Um, and then Jefferson on the west, and then Mississippi River on the east. So um, Jefferson thinking how can we bring people in from west of downtown, also thinking again about where the NGA is going to be located, and then the Mississippi River really wanting to try to um, reconnect to Cleve Landing back to downtown as well. Um, so the project started in 2017, this is a brief timeline, um, we did a lot of data collection initially, um, we actually had a subject of our team that went out and did a complete infrastructure inventory of downtown, looking at where ADA vans are located, pedestrian signals, um, bike facilities, things like that. Um, we did a, a robust public engagement starting around that time um, in April where we developed alternatives, we refined those and went back out to the public in 2018. Um, we actually had three weeks of public engagement, which I'll get into in a few more slides. Um, and then we developed the report and recommendations, and then now we're bringing it all to you, um, hopefully for adoption by the city of St. Louis. Um, so as you can see, we actually coordinated with a lot of people on the plan. Um, I think in our first week of engagement, we met with about 75 different individuals representing over 40 different groups um, and agencies that have projects going on in downtown. Um, you know, bike share was coming into town, talking to Metro about everything that we're doing there. Um, Project Connect, Great River Greenway with their shoulder design competition. Um, Trailnet with their connected vision. The city of St. Louis becoming a NACTO city and thinking about guidelines like that. Um, so this is just an example of everyone that we were trying to coordinate with and ideas that we were trying to think about when we were developing this um, report. And so it really was thinking more about um, not, not an either or, but an and. So how can we provide for all modes of transportation downtown so that people can really choose if they want to get in their car and drive somewhere, if they want to walk somewhere, ride their bike, or take public transportation. Um, so this is the first week of engagement. What we did is we sat in this building for four days and we invited people in um, from these groups, everyone from you know downtown SDL, we met with planning and urban design, NGA, I won't read all of these, but they um, were pre-identified by a core group of team members with team, about people that we needed to talk to. So the core group of team members represented us as the consultants, the Board of Public Service, um, as they were running the project, and the City Streets Department. So we thought about things that we needed to talk about in downtown. We invited people in. We had hour and a half meetings with each one of these groups talked about um, concerns, existing conditions, and then where they saw opportunities in downtown St. Louis. Um, that kind of helps drive the major uh -huh. themes, so you can see the vision, and you can go to the next slide just on that one, too. Um, so we developed a vision statement based on that week of meetings, and that was to develop a transportation plan for downtown St. Louis that supports a robust multimodal system where users of all ages and abilities feel safe, including pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, and motorists. Um, and promote economic growth, community development, better air quality, and improved public health. So there's really a lot going on in that vision statement, um, but really, if you develop a more robust multimodal transportation system, you can really start to accomplish a lot of those goals or, uh, that are in the vision. So then from that, we developed the goals that you see around. We developed the seven goals, including um, transportation choice, how can we have a more connected city, how can we enhance residents' quality of life, um, improving public health and air quality, looking at uh, better increasing social equity, economic growth, and then how can we utilize our transportation system to create a more vibrant community. Um, so then from the, the bigger goals, we thought about objectives that we could use to try to obtain these goals, um, looking at some better event traffic management, better multimodal connections and circulation, um, safety so that people feel uh, that they can walk places safely downtown or get around by their mode of transportation, ADA accessibility, mode shift, how can we get people out of their cars, um, promote walking, biking, public transportation, things like that, security, and then place making. Um, so we were able to take that vision statement as well as those goals um, and the hierarchy of streets, which will be in the next slide, back to the public in September. Um, for this, we actually had um, half-day workshops where people could drop in at any point. We did an evening meeting, too, to capture some people outside of business hours. Um, we were able to show them our map. We were able to talk to our vision statement, our goals and objectives. Um, and then we actually went out and about and did these really robust walking tours of downtown to understand the existing conditions and understand how uh, people currently operate in downtown and how they feel when they're out and about utilizing the system. So um, the major theme that's in, in this plan is this hierarchy of streets. So 
um, within the public right away you know, there's a constrained amount of space that we're working with. So on every street we can't have um, on-street parking and dedicated bike facilities and nice wide sidewalks and two, and half of both, two, direct, two directions of traffic. Um, so we really started to think about how can we prioritize modes by corridor. So that's not to say that if you're a pedestrian you can't walk on every street, but it's just to say that you know if we can try to get pedestrians all you know to walk right here we're showing it through the Gateway Mall or maybe on Clark and we can connect Union Station to Ballpark Village. These streets would have added amenities that would really bring a, a big audience of people who would feel more comfortable walking. That might be things like um, if you go to the next slide. And Jackie, how controversial was this aspect of debating it? Uh, for the hierarchy of streets? Um, so this we, we spent a lot of time on, um, develop, kind of trying to pick out the streets. Was it controversial, but it was, it had to understand all the different connections that people wanted to make. And Sean, do you have a time commitment that's going to cause you to... Uh, I made some reasons. Okay. Um, so before you go to the next slide, sorry, I <coughs> What we did is we developed these tier one, which are the double pink lines, and the tier two, which are the dashed blue lines. Um, but that's just a, kind of a level of improvement. So maybe on the tier one, um, you might do things like a lot more permanent type infrastructure, and then on tier two, you would still do those added pedestrian amenities, but maybe not to the scale of what we, you would see on the tier one facility. So it's really um, trying to get this critical mass of people on these streets so that people feel comfortable walking out and about. Um, you know, you feel like it's a place where you belong when you're in the Grove, you know, you're in the Grove, or when you're on, you know, the street, you know, you're there. Um, so these are the types of elements that we're calling for, things like, um, you know, decorative enhanced crosswalks, um, pedestrian heads with um, countdown timers, public art, this is going to be a little bit more like that, with pedestrian corridors. Um, so then also included in this multimodal plan is actually a downtown bike plan. Um, so we had also on the team, they worked with us on this. Um, one element of working with this plan in conjunction with like the traffic signal timing and the um, like real engineering operations stuff is that we were able to look at where we were recommending these bike facilities and ensure that they would still work with traffic flow. Um, so we know they're realistic solutions, they're things that can actually take place and happen. Um, so for the bicycle mode, we developed a three-tier system with um, the dark pink line of the tier one. Um, that's like a really nice separated facility like what Indianapolis has with their cultural trail. Um, it's a completely raised, elevated, totally separate from traffic, um, like urban bike trail. So an example of here, we, we have that on Tether running through downtown. Um, Tier 2 is still a, a separated facility, but it's not as protected with that physical infrastructure. So like Tesla is a really good example of what a Tier 2 would be. It's protected, um, and then that, that parking lane adds another level of protection. But you know, really at the end of the day, it's just the paint, um, things like that, and the ballers. And then Tier 3 is up here, and um, that's, on, that's a calm street. That's more of a local road, so there's really not a lot of those that are applicable in downtown. But we wanted to make sure that we would include it um, because there's calm street planning going on elsewhere in the city. And the idea with those are um, you implement so many traffic calming methods like bump out, speed hum, enhanced wayfinding, crosswalks, um, that motorists just don't feel comfortable going very fast on those roads. So it really makes it more of a shared space for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so this is an example of the different tiers you can see in these pictures. Um, also on these corridors, we're going to look at things like bike scale signage, um, you know, maybe showing where you can get in minutes versus miles. You think about things a little bit differently when you're traveling on a bike or when you're walking versus when you're in a car. Um, also in downtown right now, all of our signage is really auto-oriented. Um, so it's really good for motorists that are driving, but it's really hard to know how to get somewhere if you're not. Um, it's really not at the scale of a pedestrian or a cyclist. Um, and then the city of St. Louis is a sort of little bicycle friendly community, so monitoring those standards and maintaining those um, on those facilities. And again, things like bike signals, uh, bike signal priority, um, and then more bike parking. We found there was a big shortage of bike parking in downtown, um, and when there's not enough parking, that can really be a big deterrent to why people choose not to bike to you. Next slide. 
Um, so then the transit mode map was one that we worked with Metro on. Um, so this is kind of like an early on version of their Metro Reimagine project. Um, but we did, we were able to sit down with them and our consulting team to develop these transit priority corridors. Um, again, we have the primary and the secondary. So an example of the primary is like right here on 14th Street. Um, you know, they just made that big investment at the Civic Center Transit Station. And that's not going away anytime soon. Um, but so where they've done some really big investments so they see transit, you know, for the foreseeable future, those became the Tier 1 priority. Um, and then tier, the secondary route were still routes where they wanted to, you know, operate transit service, but maybe not that level of investment. And then that, and then that slide. So an example of um, things that you might see on this, these streets, this would require a lot of coordination with Metro, but for example, on streets where they're going to have uh, priority bus service, making bus stops more permanent, so people feel like there's actually a place to sit and wait for the bus, and that's standing at a sign, something that they don't feel comfortable at. Um, you know, there's an example of place making at a bus stop. Also, the sign is really hard to see in this picture, but um, it has real time information. You can see when the next bus is coming. So, you know, if that technology is available where you can get it on your phone, maybe we could work to put in some signs so that people could see it. Um, things like public art. Maybe some covered bike parking at transit stops. Um, those are the types of things that we would recommend on these priority transit corridors. And then we also have the vehicle mode map. Um, so it was really interesting putting this plan together to hear just the different types of conversations. Um, you know, hotel operators were saying, well, how can we get people out of downtown because their guests are wanting to leave and get out of downtown when they're getting on their business? And then, you know, other people are like, how do we move people into downtown? So, Still keeping in mind that a lot of people are driving to downtown St. Louis and trying to keep um, vehicular access downtown for them. Um, we developed, again, the Tier 1 and Tier 2. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, it mainly talks mostly about um, the travel lanes and the posted speed limit sign. So in downtown, there's really not a lot of posted speeds, and posted speeds are based on um, the design. but. Actually, if you go back to the previous slide, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so we wanted to look at connections to the interstate, which is what the Tier 1 routes were. Um, and then Tier 2 routes would be like Washington Avenue. You know, we really struggle with trying to prioritize this for vehicles, um, but it's a really good two-way street that connects all the way through downtown. <coughs> so maintaining that access is a Tier 2 street with one level of travel, with one lane of travel in each direction. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and then other things that we would talk about on these vehicular streets is maybe looking at these things called um, bus zones. And this is actually a pretty new idea um, that NASA just came out with on some guidance last year. But looking at um, how can you better utilize the curb space that you have. Um, so curb space is a really big asset for the city of St. Louis. Um, and so maybe having it for a parking stall all day isn't our highest and best use all the time. So maybe it's a delivery zone when we need to get freight deliveries. Maybe it's a curbside pickup when there's a big event happening, things like that. Um, looking at signal upgrades, smart parking, dynamic parking prices, um, things like that. So in addition to the hierarchy of streets, we also um, looked at about 10 uh, focus areas. So what we did, um, we, like I said, we had our operation people and our bike people and everyone together looking at what would be realistic. So we actually put together some conceptual level, level drawings. I didn't put all of these in here, but if you go to the next slide, um, this is an example of what's in the bike plan. So we did drawings um, similar to this, and then aerials. This is an example of what Tucker might look like with that separated bike trail um, that I was discussing previously. So then we took all that back to the public in January. Um, we were in City Hall, so it was just open for pass through traffic, anyone that wanted to stop by. Um, we got a lot of, we got about 100 people to come on stage, so we were pretty excited about that, but we didn't get any major concerns um, or any major criticisms. You know, people were pretty excited to see what was going on and trying to make downtown St. Louis a little bit more multimodal friendly. Um, and then I'll just, I'll kind of go through these slides quickly, but we have, um, in addition to the hierarchy of streets, so kind of thinking that we didn't want to have a plan that was all this investment, um, that was a huge undertaking. Um, we wanted to get some immediate opportunities out there right now so that the city can start working on these. 
um, the benefit of the hierarchy of streets, though, is that when redevelopment opportunities come in downtown, the city can really leverage some of that public right-of-way stuff in front of the building to try to put uh, to try to put effort in towards making these goals happen. Um, so some immediate project opportunities is you know, looking at pedestrian updates at pedestrian updates at Fort Smith and Clark. Um, right now there's not pedestrian signals on all of those um, corners, but a lot of people are walking there because that's how you connect to the transit center. Um, looking at updating pedestrian access at this intersection right here at 18th and Soto is a really critical access for pedestrians coming into downtown, especially with its proximity to the Metrolink stop. Um, but right now it's a really challenging intersection to walk across um, and then, you know, try to downgrade across the bridge. Next slide. Um, looking at opportunities to maybe remove street parking for cars and turn it into street parking for bikes or for scooters or any of the, the shared mobility um, devices that we have now. Um, you can do that with a couple of brass and paint, a really low cost option. Um, and then also these parklets. So essentially what that does is it removes the parking space for a car. It extends the public plaza space um, for people. You want to go to the next slide? So we actually put one up on Washington Avenue um, on parking day back in September. And um, it was a huge hit. A lot of pass by traffic, a lot of cars slowed down just to see what was going on. Um, you know, people were just taking advantage of those tables, sitting, talking, playing games. Um, it really got a lot of positive feedback. Um, also, looking at how can we maybe try to use more pilot or tactical projects. Um, a lot of cities are doing these, so they're testing something out. It's really great because you can test it and see if it works. Then also, while you're doing that, you can educate the general public about how this new type of facility um, would work and operate. Um, you know, and potentially in the plan where we talked about one option of Clark being closed, so that's being closing Clark to vehicular traffic by Ballpark Village and opening it up to people traffic. Um, so, you know, this is an example of a road that was closed and they, they were able to make this nice creative space with a can of paint and some furniture. Um, so thinking about some more short-term immediate project opportunities like that to see how they work. Um, again, more tactical type projects, and then these leading pedestrian intervals, these are something that the city's actually already been able to implement in downtown. So how that works is the uh, pedestrians are given a head start to cross the street before the signal turns green, um, and this helps avoid some of the turning conflicts in case the motorist doesn't see the pedestrian while they're crossing the street. Um, and the street department has actually already implemented some of these. I think out there on 14th and, or 15th in the market right there, there's one that's operating. Um, and then in addition to the immediate projects, the hierarchy of streets, we also wanted to put in some policy recommendations because um, we could really improve multimodal connections and circulation just with the way we think about things. Um, so some examples of these are these like sea tour routes. Especially now how we ball experience that when sidewalks are closed, it's really hard to get around. Um, maybe thinking about promoting detour routes, um, looking at like off-peak freight delivery or um, Park, responsive parking pricing to on street demand. And I think that's it. So, a lot of information I tried to get through there. Thank you. <laughs> so, one of the things you, you probably have just taken away this is quite a comprehensive look at downtown and transportation, the multimodal yeah. aspects to it. And you saw the question I asked at the moment at the start was have we resolved conflicts? between people's ideas and the degree of stakeholder engagement, the degree of best practices that is communicated that I, they've done an excellent job of that. We've had many a concern and sort of, I shouldn't say fights, but debates prior to the development of the process going to this point. Very useful. Before we open the public meeting, any questions from the commissioners? <coughs> Jackie, thanks for your presentation. Um, so, as it relates to policy recommendations, there are two things I didn't see that I'm curious if they did and not why. Um, you mentioned uh, speed limits uh, earlier in the presentation, whether that's the basis on the reduction of speed uh, downtown or anything related to the speed. Downtown, well, first question. And secondly, we got a lot of pavement in downtown, and it was built for a city that operated much differently than we do today. And it benefits us in a lot of ways, but it's also 
creates a lot of opportunity, potentially, in my mind at least. And you mentioned Washington Avenue being in terms of single, thorough street, you know, from one end of downtown with two-way traffic. We, we could have other opportunities for that that we choose to currently have as being four lanes one way or another way or one, uh, you know, uh, direction of traffic opposed to two other recommendations for re-evaluating uh, the way that our streets are currently laid out. Um, so I'll start with the second question because that came up right at the start of the project was yeah. evaluating the one way to make conversion. Um, and after all of the initial discussions we had with like all of those groups of people, it really never emerged as a major priority. Um, we did look on some streets where it was a big priority, looking at what would happen if you converted um, you know, one way to two way. Another thing is it's really cost prohibitive to update all of those intersections um, and the, the signal equipment. And John, you can step in more if you want, but I think the main thing was um, you know, the priority. When we looked at everything that we were looking at in downtown, it, it really wasn't emerging as a major priority for people. Okay. We, um, we started, we said, which one? So some people said, we want all two-way streets. And we said, well, you know, you, you've got parking, you've got drive lanes, you've got cycle facilities, you've got deliveries. We only have so much space. Um, which one should we look at? There was a couple we did look at. And yeah. When it came down to it, the priority was the big tent to leave it one way. As far as the extra space up in Tucker, that's why the movement occurs in the long term. It makes sense to some roads. Tucker is a great example. Um, it's expensive. So is there a shorter term way to narrow that street? And then when you reconstruct it someplace down the road, you would have the plan in place. We've got the plan in place to, to move curbs. So there's some ideas for long-term moving curbs, but the idea is what can we do now? Um, so that's really what we do. Thank you for that. So, so I get the, the, the priority, like, you know, you want to focus on what you can focus on, and you want to make sure that you're providing product to the city that is something that is going to be valued and, and ideally utilized. But as a, if, if it's, sometimes things aren't our priority just because we don't have the best practice at our fingertips to say that it should be a priority. As recommendations go and best practices go, would that be something that you would have suggested we look at if it had come up as a priority? Curves, they're all, we got all kinds of recommendations to Skitty Street and Luke Curve. I just mean traffic directional pattern. Oh, the one way versus two way? Yeah. I just we, traffic flow and out of downtown as it relates to You that. know, we, we looked at the one way two way conversions and we didn't find any places where it made sense. Okay. So it isn't that it's not best practice. It's just it. we we looked at them. Let's look at them one on one. Some people said let's we didn't show the whole grid two way. Okay, well what do you want to give up parking or do we not want to have bike facilities? Mm -hmm. What do you want? What do you want to do? And in every case, it said we're we're good the way we are. Okay, is that it? Oh sorry, is that information in here though? Anywhere that we looked at the one way to two way? Yeah. Um, it might be in the public engagement part of the appendix, but that is supposed to be just like a very digestible part of the overall look of everything. So that's the other part. I'm in my appendix. I'm only seeing three maps. There wasn't anything else. Yeah, it's um, a huge. Oh. <laughs> there you go. So what you doing tonight? <laughs> okay, so and one reason why we tried to do the main document to be more digestible is because we didn't want this to be something that, like, you know, the fear is of all the plans just sits on the shelf and no one does anything. Like, so we wanted people to be able to read it and go out and be like, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to implement, and this is things that we know we can get done um, in downtown to make it, to make it better. Yeah. Can I address the speed question? Yeah, There's actually a national debate right now, and we're, look, we're looking at a national level of revising the way speed limits are set. Um, and I've been involved in some of that. So, if we just change the posted speed, can we put up a sign? And I don't know that there are many speed limit signs in downtown anyway. Yeah. So if we change the posted speed by ordinance, it does nothing. Sure. There's no enforcement there, and there's also no physical. Thing. You've got to provide the right environment to go speed down. So what we recommended is actually in a place where we're crossing a bike tier one bike facility or tier one veteran facility, the design speed should be more, no more than 25 miles an hour. So by design, we try to slow the speed down. But um, that's that's the day is if we say, well, we're going to put an ordinance in or we're going to put a sign, and there's no physical way to just give actually people a false security. 
but it doesn't actually change the speed. So we put a recommendation in, again, for skinnier streets and cut slower than down, um, but you can't do that just by yeah. passing on an ordinance thing. Down. Completely agree, and that 100% makes sense. I mean, it's, a, it's an enforcement challenge that we know we have citywide, but then also there's a physical design component that can help alleviate the sense of safety for drivers to just bear it down. But so the, it's the it less comfortable. The way as a from national policy, we typically set speeds as a thing we call the 86th percentile speed. So we measure speed and how fast people are going, and we set speed limits by people going that speed or 85th. 85% of people going that speed are slower. Um, the interesting twist that has come up is that because that's the speed that drivers feel safe. So nobody asks pedestrians and bicyclists how they, they, they feel. Right. Um, so that gets to that other part of it. Is, okay, well, there's other users that take them from these needs need to be taken into account. Okay, thanks for that. Speaking of safety, just out of my own mind, urban living now has become a little bit more nefarious. Uh, when you have a mixture of bikes and pedestrians and cars, and such close proximity, how do you, what, what's your safety concerns or thoughts have been put into that? Because when you're putting those jettisons out into the middle, you know, into the middle of the street, now you said you've got speed issues, you've got a mix of a pedestrian and a bike, it just seems to be a little bit more dangerous in my mind. But a lot of it is design and having the separated facilities and dedicated facilities for bicyclists, right, and having the right um, signal equipment so bikes know when to go, having the right paint and kind of bike box to small that. And the other part of speed, the speed is a huge determiner of if you get hit at 25 miles an hour, you have a pretty good chance of being okay. If you get hit at 40 miles an hour, not so much. So by doing the design and skinning up streets and putting in those dedicated facilities, you can really enhance the safety for the users. You think like that. Yeah, we talked about the leading pedestrian intervals, because that does just give you a head start so you're not fighting with the car that we get to right away. So there's lots of little tricks we can do that have proven to be effective all elsewhere. And so what we did, and this is with those, those mode maps, mm -hmm. you know, so where we're recommending the bicycle traffic, you know, we laid all these over each other to make sure that nothing was in conflict. And then where we did see conflict with vehicular traffic, that's where we lowered the priority for vehicles to try to reduce that design speed. Um, it might, might also be counterintuitive, but it, you know, and I'm by no means a traffic professional, but the more things that you have requiring the attention of a driver causes that driver to pay more attention, to drive slower, and to be more attentive. And so if you've got bikes and you've got the parklets and, and you've got, you know, street level trees, you, you're, the driver is less mindless behind the wheel and more, you know, constantly kind of scanning the environment. So it's almost the more activity that you have, the safer the people tend to drive. It's a good example of that, when they redid the boot, before they rebuilt the boom bridge in St. Charles County, it was two lanes of 12 feet and made a three lane flight test feet. So actually it's like nine and a half feet for interstate. And the crash rate dropped. People expected with all these lanes and really skinny lanes to crash rate so, But people paid attention. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a couple things. Um, first of all, just a question about the parklets. Are, are those um, are those being implemented? Is there design and implementation funding available for those? Um, so the we don't have any funding recommendations for those specifically in this plan. But like an example of what could be used for that is um, money that we get from the bike share ordinance that we they have to pay per vehicle. They have to pay for you to be here. And then um, both companies have a pledge to give a dollar per day per vehicle. And so those are actually discussions that are happening um, with the streets department on how to set that money aside because it's supposed to only go for bike and pet improvements. So projects like that that are kind of more low-hanging fruit um, hopefully could be used with some funds like that. Right now, this is still a concept. Right, so we, we didn't design like a, a general parklet prototype for people to take and put out um, in the street. It's just the concept of, you know, where it might work in them. There's no money to do that right now. There's, there's nothing set up by the city to actually implement that suggestion. Yeah, no, not really. Okay. Right now. Um, and then the second is just a comment um, about the off-peak freight delivery. Um, my neighborhood, which is based in downtown, has been fighting um, with uh, off-peak freight and also the garbage trucks um, for years. 
Um, so I, I know that uh, a lot of people think downtown is mostly just for businesses, but after 5 o'clock it becomes a neighborhood for many of us. Um, so I, I would ask, and I will actually follow up with my alderman and um, the freight district on this, uh, it, it would be ideal if that could end by 10 p.m. Just throwing that out there. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. It, it's really hard when you have a freight truck backing up into your um, back door. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I want to I want to touch back on the one-way, two-way street. So, as a former resident of downtown myself, it seems like there is always a lot of conversation between neighborhood residents that they would like to see more convergence of these one-way streets. So, I'm curious when you say that it wasn't didn't come up as a priority. Who is saying it wasn't a priority? Well, okay, so maybe I phrased that wrong. But when we sat down and looked at what we could accomplish with what our scope of work was, we really had to look at areas to focus. So um, I think that one way to two way was really a balance of the space that we have in the public right of way. Um, and so you know we tried to look at these other op these other ways to try to better use the space that we have in the public right of way. Um, as far as who you know specifically, we talked the first group of stakeholders that we talked to. Um, it's where we got a lot of ideas on existing conditions and opportunities and things like that. And I think Sean was Yeah, so, you know, a good example is Amos Harris brought in and wanted to look at Dump and 8th Street and convert those. And, and he spent a good amount of money looking at traffic flow, looking at cost um, of converting and at the, in the middle. He brought a development strategy to look at what the economic impact to the benefits of businesses. In the middle of that process, he decided to leave it one way. He was pretty much set on it's got to be two way, and he realized, okay, for what it would cost him for his development and for the benefits of it, it makes more sense to leave it one way like it is. So I went to the prairie. We spent a lot of time looking at a couple of these, um, but people, some people came in and said we want to go over to the two way, and where we started this whole process is um, the streets department, BPS would get requests. We want to have two-way traffic in every street and on-street parking on both sides and bicycle facilities and white sidewalks and these are done dead. So at some point you look at the space you have and you say, okay, how much of this is going to go to the sidewalk? How much of this is going to go to bike facilities? How much of this is going to parking? And where it's one way, what we basically said is there's enough space left over for one lane of cars. If we go with two lanes of cars, we're taking away something from somebody. We're taking away parking or sidewalk or bike facilities, and the people on there feel like that other uses is more important than to have another lane of cars. Yeah. I understand that. It just seems to me that if you're basing priority based on how expensive it, it is, that's not necessarily the right, right answer. It still might be important. Yes, it might not be high on you know, the city doesn't have enough money to convert all of these things, but it'd still be nice to see it is feasible to do in these certain areas or these streets could be sometime in the future, say, say we do get a huge federal infrastructure spending plan and cities flush with money. Um, <laughs> well, you know, this would be nice to see. By priority, it wasn't a cost. It was what's the highest and best use of the land available. And the highest and best use of the land available was not for another lane of traffic. So you wouldn't be adding a lane of traffic. You'd just be converting a two-way, one-way street into it. And most cases, most one way streets are one lane. A lot of them are. You get on 7th and 8th Street, so where you get, especially if those conditions become an issue. Okay. Um, I didn't see how Amos Harris' proposed project integrated into the study. On, on uh, the 7th Street? Street? Yeah. Yeah, so he, he was really actually very involved in one of our stakeholder meetings. Um, and so, what we have it in here is a priority pedestrian corridor. So he was looking at the two-way traffic with his proposed project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we sat down, we actually did conceptual level drawings of 7th Street, um, and he's seen them, and he's seen our recommendations, and he thinks it fits with his priorities and how. So it is in here. Project. Yeah. So the conceptual um, like drawings here. are in that okay. on 7th Street. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is. Uh, as far as signal light synchronization, I, know, I hear a lot of talk about how frustrated with the signal lights and how they communicate, navigate downtown. So, 
talk a little bit about what did you come up with as far as the signal lights? Um, so our signal operations engineers are actually just implemented a new timing plan in downtown. Um, they were involved in the planning process to the extent that we looked at where can we reduce lanes of vehicular traffic um, and how it still makes sense with signal timing. But um, as far as like the actual timing plan that they put in, I don't know about that, um, but I do know you know, we had an extensive count, everything that goes into a new signal timing plan. And I believe it's all been implemented. Right, and, and so no. one of the issues, and, and be curious to know exactly what the complaints come from are related to events. Okay. Um, so one of the, and this really helped, I think, gel this whole plan together at the beginning. Um, and we talked to all these different groups. Event traffic, for example, was a big deal. It was a big deal to the Cardinals, because people needed to come in out of game. Mm -hmm. Big deal to hotel owners, because people can't get to the hotel. The casino said, when you have a big event, they lose money because people can't get into the site. Mm -hmm. The residents said, you know, it's hard to get to our, um, get home. So, um, so that's an idea, of, uh, an example where that was. And what we did with it is we balanced. We got a number, we did the arch ground, we took out a major arterial from downtown St. Louis, we got rid of Memorial Drive. We put all that traffic on 4th Street. So there was a balance between um, where can we do things like leading pedestrian intervals and reduce pavement, but still move traffic in and out of downtown mm -hmm. as effectively as possible. Along with that, that played into this idea of modal shift and getting people to use bikes or scooters or cars so if they feel comfortable parking further away from the stadium on ballpark, maybe they'll use other interchanges and they're all not going to try to get out mm -hmm. on the same interchange and clog things up. So a lot of these themes started with how do we manage traffic but make it safe and, and go through that balance and then what are the components that need to go, go into that. So the city's invested a lot of money and, and they've got one of the best traffic signal systems in the country, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, we go around and, and they have some very unique with the real time crime center co-located with the traffic management center. Uh, they can observe traffic flow, and they have special timing plans that go into place for all these. Um, at some point after Cardinals game, when all the people are trying to leave, you, you manage the system the best you can, and, and not everybody's going to get out of there in two minutes. You know, it's going to take a little time. On that point, for events, is there a study to move people out of the garages and basically out of the city or the interstate to get where they need to get to without a to mitigate all the congestion because you know, there's frustration at um, Mount Enterprise Center, people trying to come out of there. Pedestrians are all over the place and so cars have a really hard time getting out of the garages. Is there a plan, is there a study, or is there a conversation with trying to come up with a good strategy to move people, whether it's a Cardinals game or a Blues hockey game or whatever you've been making? So those are and those are important that the city has invested in event timing plan. So you can't expect after blue game you're gonna get out of your car and be on the interstate in two minutes, right? Because mm -hmm. all those people are leaving. So we do have that expectation just like we want to park everywhere. Right. Right. You want to park right next yeah. to it, right? Yeah. So that so so the idea is for the blue game, you know, maybe you park a little further away mm -hmm. and then there's not as much congestion and you kind of um, disperse that traffic coming in and, and, and being able to get out. So there's a balance between making the city more walkable and bikeable and moving traffic as a, you know as fast as possible. And what we've done, and this, this study was unique in the studies I've been involved with, we had the bike experts sit down with the traffic signal timing, the people who actually develop those plans and figure out, okay, how can we make this intersection work? Um, and there's, there's trade-offs and balances between everything. We can't make the system work perfectly for everybody all the time. And, am I hearing well, properly? I think I am that our system for, for timing and our signals is sophisticated enough to do sophisticated solutions to post-event and peak times and not just push a button and put everything in flash and yellow. Yeah, so one of the, the cool things they can do now, and, and they've been working on this, is that when the Cardinals get out, the system can self-detect certain traffic patterns and put into place the Cardinals after the end timing plan. Mm -hmm. so, Typically, we'd have to have somebody there to push a button. Cardinals are done, push the button, put that plan in place. It actually can detect that there's a lot of people coming out of certain areas and, and put into place the, the timing plan automatically. So you have a very sophisticated system that's handling traffic about as well as could be expected um, for those events. And then I, I just want to remind, um, you know, one of the goals 
or the objectives was slow shift, so to get people out of their cars. So, you know, not for tourists, but for residents of the St. Louis region, maybe they can park at a Metrolink stop and then ride into downtown because all of a sudden downtown, um, they feel like they can walk places a little bit better and a little bit more easily. One last question, or uh, 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 we'll get some perspective or something. Um, I personally think navigating downtown is pretty easy. When I was a kid in Chicago, you know, traveling back and forth from the suburbs, I, they had all these streets going in one direction. I ended up on the highway, and I was trying to figure out why would because I'm so used to St. Louis, you just turn a corner and you go the opposite direction or whatever. What, what sense did that, does that make to have four streets all going northbound or whatever direction? Like in downtown. downtown, in a downtown. In Chicago? Yes. <clears throat> We're trying to get people out of the interstate. That's what that's that, that, that was, And it worked. Huh? Yeah, I, I found myself, I'm like, how the heck did I get up here? So, <laughs> it's interesting. A hundred years ago, the streets were multimodal. We had three cars and people walking in place and all kinds of things happening. And then the traffic engineering profession, we had this term called friction. Friction was anything to slow down traffic, which was pedestrians and bicyclists. So we tried to do whatever we could to get rid of all the friction and, and have four lanes of traffic heading north of downtown so we can work and get out of there. We found out that the system really made it hard for people to live there, for people to hang out there, right? So there's a big movement, and I go back to um, Secretary LaHood, who was uh, Obama's first um, Secretary of Transportation, put it in place a national food street policy. And since that time, that, that charge was you need to rethink the streets, you need to look at all the uses in the streets and design the streets to accommodate everybody, not just not just cars. Um, so St. Louis never went quite that far, but you know, we had plans. We had 755, which was a blow to Lafayette Square, right? So there were plans to do a lot of those things that at some point got shut down here. Um, I guess thankfully some of them didn't happen. Thank you. With that, we need to open the public meeting. So I have a motion. So thank you. Previous thank you. role. Oh, previous role, no objection. With that, let us open the public meeting. Do we have anyone listed on that account? Okay. But um, I'm going to do something uh, with Alderman Ogilvy here. Uh, I'm going to ask him a couple things. Uh, All right, what's your next day? You crossed the line. Uh, the, the, uh, two things is Alderman Ogilvy has announced that he's not running for re-election. Oh. Uh, and two, as we heard from the CPB team, uh, a lot of professional work in an examination here. Um, that this has been a sophisticated. There's going to be a second question I'm going to ask, not of Scott, but somebody else. Uh, about using all that, but but Scott, as you may know, has been a leading advocate in changing some of our principles about bicycles and our complete streets and whatnot. Uh, and I want him to mention what NACTO is. Uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials. Transportation Officials. And partly through his urging and the urging of the mayor that this is the first year that we've become a member of that. And Jackie, if you want to expand on, on what the blessings are of having that membership. Yeah, so um, what NACTO does is it develops guidelines for how to rethink urban streets so that they're more focused on people. Um, benefits of the membership, uh, the city gets access to other member cities, so we have a lot of resources with um, colleagues about things that they're doing, things that they're implementing, what's working, what's not. Um, there's also an annual conference, I believe the city gets to go to that, one person gets to go to that and then learn all the new, latest and greatest best practices. Um, but, and then also as new technology comes out, um, for example, the dogless bike share, um, St. Louis and Liza was really instrumental in putting together that NACO guide on how to um, best manage dogless bike share um, in your city. So there's a lot of new guidance that transportation is ever changing um, that St. Louis gets the benefit of being a part of. Any other, other comments you want to make about Alton Global and transportation downtown? No, I am not as familiar with this. I'm here to learn about this plan, so I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to uh, display my ignorance. Or something. Thanks. Well, we can quote it for posterity if you do. But uh, okay. let's how you use this plan. So basically, um, what's going to happen here is the guideline for. What we're going to do going forward, okay? It's our roadmap for when we apply for grants or when we do projects or anything we do going forward. 
in any of these areas. It's going to be our guideline, our roadmap. So very important to us uh, because obviously, you know, we're talking about CMAT grants, we're talking about FCPS grants, and even, you know, Don, we talk about the whole bit with downtown development as far as what happens with neighborhoods and things like that as well. We're looking at these plans as well as enhancing those for economic development opportunities as well. So um, it's critical to us to have this plan in place because I think a lot of you guys talk about there are complaints about downtown and there are complaints about how things work. And so, you know, we have to address that and have to know in a holistic manner how to approach this as opposed to just kind of, you know, ready, aim, fire approach that has happened for so many years and do little projects that come tie together. So um, for me, it's a critical plan to have in place. Mr. Chairman? Well, is, this, uh, is the appendix going to be available to the public as well, or is that something? Because when I looked online, this this wasn't in there either. I assume we have electronically. We'll post it. Okay. okay. With that, we've had the previous. We closed it. No, we still open. You need to open it. You've opened it, and you need to move to close the public meeting. So moved. Good move. Second, second, and third. Previous roll and objection. Hearing none. Public meeting is closed. With that, now we've, now we've had our question and answer from the uh, commission. Uh, we want to speak about what the call for action is. So the call for action is to adopt it again. But we're having a public hearing here tonight. It was a, a very much engaged process, as you know, including them hosting an open house at City Hall on my birthday um, of last year. I went to it. You know, I did go to it. Uh, we didn't receive information from the sources that we put out there as a, as a safety net, uh, so we'll move on from that. Uh, we do want to say that uh, this is a transportation topical plan in an area where we have uh, the, certainly the strategic land use plan and the downtown uh, now plan. Uh, so we and Connie Tomasula, who's not here tonight, we're closely with Jackie to go through the downtown now plan uh, to see whether there were conflicts or things that were related to this that would be uh, appropriate updates. So we were having done that, uh, we find the plan, the plan as an additional thing to help us guide downtown, as Rich talked about, and that it's in conformity with those two plans, and we recommend uh, that you adopt it. With that, we've heard the, the answer to the call to action. Any Questions? Any concerns? Any? So, just a quick question. So once we say we approve this here tonight, it moves to the to the board of aldermen. No, or it's just yeah, so so no so so unless there's something that our purview is in yeah. particular is about the citywide comprehensive plan. That's ours. But we can do that on neighborhood plans. And a topical plan is a little bit more general in nature, but we're the ones that approve it. But it gets in our records. But as we talked about, it's really BPS that will be using it as a guide for much of this. Uh, okay. We kind of, it would tell us the plan, we're basically acknowledging it as, a, as an official. <laughs> and keep it up front and center so it doesn't get lost in the background. All right. Is that any, any action? Been moved. Seconded. Call for a roll, please. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Commissioner Benton. Aye. Commissioner Bradley. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Commissioner Peoples. Aye. Commissioner Vine. Aye. Commissioner Young. Aye. And Chair Strada. Aye. Motion passes with all present. All right. With that, that plan has been approved. Mr. Chairman, I might recommend we take a short break. Yeah, I would. Uh, if we can take a five minute health break. And we'll be free to be in that sub 15 for that clock or whatever clock. Yep, sub 15. <laughs> Stay with me. Stay with me. How many do we need for a form? Sir, how many do we need for a form? Oh, right now. We've got 13 of these. Thank you. Okay, because I'm going to have to leave at 730. If you go, the rest are stuck. What up? Uh, if you go, the rest are stuck. <laughs> We've got one. I knew you were going to talk about trash test. <laughs> <laughs> 
I could kill. I mean, I there have been nights. I went down there one night and like accosted one of the trash truck drivers. I was like, what? Problem. Problem. Well, I, I was something of an audience. Right? Oh, you have one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I once applied for a job in Boston. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's commercial truck. I thought it was. We do that. What was the name of the I have a conspiracy by the management um, industry behind us. So, the ordinance you see online, I can't find it our neighborhood has been complaining about it for years. I just put in a number of Well, I mean, the public doesn't hear that. I, I don't know if this is like legit or not, but a police officer called me from a number from like DeSoto, Illinois. I'm perfectly happy now. Saying he was a city cop. Which is a police cop. He's from his private cell phone. I'm just going to do that. But eventually, he told me that the ordinance only applies to residential neighborhoods. It doesn't apply in all downtown. Because it's considered commercial or mixed use? Okay. I don't know. I want to copy that ordinance. I asked him to send it to me, and I haven't seen it yet. Did you get an ordinance? The whole ordinance was trash, though. I had a trash truck commercial vendor at a neighbor that was renovating his house, so he got one of those big bags that comes with a service to come and take the stuff. Huge truck, and we live in this little pocket off the Clifton Hunts uh, Park. He's out there at 5.30 in the morning, uh. and uh, I went out and had a visit with him. And I said, you know, the law would be out here before 7 o'clock in the morning. Oh, does that apply to this neighborhood? Yeah. <laughs> they come at 10, um, 1, 4, and 5.30 oh. in my neighborhood. I've been tracking it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, Mr. Chairman, you yes, sir. you do have a quorum. I would have one person not at the table. Uh, so we could proceed. Let's do it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, we only got yes, about seven. We have a, a so, I'm going to talk just a little bit as we look at this. Dan Krasnow, I'm going to quickly go through some updates to the Lafayette Square Historic District standards. They already have standards. These are a change. Why I want to talk just a little bit is because this is part of seeing a number of things come together. Uh, I'm not sure Randy had joined us when we did this. But uh, some of you were not present when we made a change to the Lafayette Square Neighborhood Plan uh, in April. I'm looking at to say yeah, she, she visited us day. that night as a as a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we changed the Lafayette Square Neighborhood Plan. When we changed the Lafayette Square Neighborhood Plan, it was based on input from the neighborhoods that had been working with a developer in particular for the, for the northwest quadrant, a blighted area of 13 acres. That development has, has since um, been structured and formulated to follow the neighborhood plan. So we amended the neighborhood plan. Uh, we put in place a certain zoning overlay to make it now being legally that you have to do uses that are in compliance with the neighborhood plan. There's a redevelopment plan that's going to follow that that's going through the Board of Aldermen that we've approved. And part of the process of that is a historic district, historic neighborhood. So Dan's going to explain some updates quickly because we're friendly and knowledgeable people here about updating the historic district standards to be in sync with all this. He's the director of the Cultural Resources Office. Don, you took my first two lines of my presentation. Yeah, it took him five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a laser pointer. And, you know. <laughs> My boss. No comment. Hey, hey, uh, hey. Um, so, yeah, so I'm here tonight uh, to present 
um, an overview of the changes to Lafayette Square historic district standards. Uh, Lafayette Square has been a historic district since the early 1970s and has had two or three iterations of its standards revised. Um, I guess I'm going the wrong way. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not talk about it at all. So, um, uh, for overview, the district includes portions of the 6th Ward and the 7th Ward. Uh, this is the revision of the standards. Uh, the previous standards revision was done in 2012, so this is new from that. Um, uh, the biggest changes to the standards that are coming from this is changes to new construction uh, rules and regulations. Um, uh, rehabilitation standards for existing buildings in the neighborhood largely remain the same, and I think there's a feeling that those are working well in terms of protecting the uh, design history of the uh, contributing buildings to the district. Um, and the sort of overarching philosophy of the of the new standards is that um, the new construction is based on the degree to which there is historic context on a given parcel of land or a given city block. Uh, just a note on the process. So at the November meeting, the Preservation Board, just about a week or so ago, the Preservation Board approved, as is required by uh, Ordinance 64689, um, the, uh, the revised standards, which is allowed under a process to the Preservation Board. Uh, that process in that ordinance also requires the Planning Commission to review and approve those uh, standards. And then it's um, ready to be submitted to the Board of Aldermen um, for the vision of the board bill for passage, and then the um, and then mayoral signature is required, of course. So um, before Dan, before you go, uh, I just want to make a point: is that as I discussed, the, we've done a number of things related to Lafayette Square of uh, late. Uh, we're about ready to lose Alderman Boyd uh, from seeing the overlooked overview. Alderman, is there any questions you might have? We will still maintain a quorum. No, I kind of offline ask a lot of questions, and I'm satisfied. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start with historic infill sites. <coughs> it's really hard to see on this, and um, I apologize for that. But um, basically, the areas that you see that are not in either the brown or the light blue color. Um, are parcels that are sort of designated historic infill. There aren't a lot of those parcels that are vacant in the neighborhood, but there are, there are some. And of course, while it's very hard to get a demolition approved in Lafayette Square, there always is the odd chance that a building will either be demolished or um, new, small, scattered uh, sites will be created where there can be infill construction. So the idea of these standards in those all the areas with the blue and the brown there is that the um, new construction has to be based on what's called a historic model example, and that really means almost an identical copy of a historic building. So you see um, examples here. These are particularly along Golden, where um, you have new, oh, wrong way new construction, say on this building here, and then new construction here, and then there's more um, historic buildings sort of scattered out. But these buildings are designed to be almost, um, you know, to, to blend right in and be a little bit hard even to tell the historic from the, from the, the uh, contemporary. So here's um, an example of an infill site where you have a pretty tight space and you have a lot of historic buildings around. The next sort of level of, of uh, new construction is new construction sites with historic context. So these are the areas in light blue that you see scattered about uh, in the area. Most of the focus on redevelopment and new construction in the neighborhood, uh, see if I can get this right, is going to be up in this area here, which those of you who have been on the uh, Commission for a while know is um, the area where there's a quite bit of activity in terms of revising the neighborhood plan and redevelopment plans and such. So uh, what's what's true about the the blue areas is the requirement is that 
Um, they still have to be based on a model example, but they're more loosely based on a model example um, in the new standards. So, for example, uh, these two slides will show you that this is a building that, um, while looking pretty historic, is not um, matching the surrounding buildings um, nearly as much in terms of the height's a little lower, the window dimensions are a little different, the proportions are a little bit different. So there's a more loose opportunity to relate to the historic structures because there are fewer of them in these areas. And um, this is an example you can see here where on this side of the street, that would be required, this looser based, off, based on historic, because as you can see on the other side of the street, there just isn't the, the, the density of urban fabric to, to, to uh, relate to. So those require, as I said, a model example, but there's um, less of a requirement that they specifically relate. Here's another slide, for example, um, one of these lots where we have this um, remnant of a building that um, we are still hopeful will be um, revitalized into an occupiable structure. But as you can see, it's just about the only historic building on this block. There's actually, if you go, um, we're seeing Missouri in the foreground in the, in the back here is LaSalle Avenue. Um, there is another historic building further down the block at the end of LaSalle towards Jefferson, for those of you who know the neighborhood. But at the end of the day, the historic building, the new construction that was on this block doesn't need to be, um, in the new standards, would not be required to be used based as, as, um, as um, uh, granular, in a granular way on his model example. Under the current standards, it does have to be. So, um, and so that's that section. And then finally, the last section is new construction on large sites with no historic context. So for those of you who are familiar with the neighborhood, you know that this corridor along here, especially um, the old Praxair site in the middle, um, and then you've got the Mack truck site here, and then you've got another kind of trucking facility here. Um, those sites, uh, and this is designed, again, to, to kind of go hand in glove with the neighborhood plan that was revised. Uh, there is no requirement to be based on a historic model example. There are rules about using um, sort of the traditional materials found in the neighborhood and, um, uh, um, and fetish for telephone poles. They're in all your pictures. <laughs> uh, not me, but maybe one of my staff. <laughs> so those rules are more general about um, placement on the lot, about materials. Um, there's some very minimal height um, requirements that are designed to, again, go hand in glove with the neighborhood plan. And, um, you know, obviously there's a strong interest from a current uh, developer in doing this area, but, you know, what we've tried to do in working with the neighborhood is not just assume that that's going to get built, that this, these standards are going to be in this place for a number of years, and whether they fully build out the site or not, these standards will be relevant for any other developer who comes down the pike and will be, will be um, appropriate. So those two blocks, so didn't zone the commercial and not residential? Was it on the Shoto side? They were industrial. And, uh, industrial. And, and we zoned them down to the lowest category of, we, uh, one action a number of years ago, we zoned them down to the lowest category of commercial, <coughs> possibly residential. And then we use this most recently the special use district overlay to right. to put it into a, a more compatible use than than uh, industrial on the corner. But the, the the historic district does not spend a lot of time in that section particularly talking about anything related to what the buildings would be used for. With the understanding that there would be flexibility whether they would be a mixed-use commercial residential or just a single use for a hotel potentially or perhaps there will be some standalone residential buildings which would be allowed but the standards don't really get into that they're more dealing with the form of the building. Okay. So I'll stand just to move over to the chair. Oops. Um, yes. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, that stands presentation so you're open for, for questions. Questions or calls for action? I've got a quick question. So um, this is the packet that we were given is the full set of standards with the new stuff added to it, correct? It's the what, full, what is? That is the full set of design standards for the historic district. So there were 
things added to this as part of this amendment. Added slash revised? Or revised. I'm sorry, I'm not following. I'm trying to do, ask for change this. He have everything that's involved with the Lafayette Square standards as they are as a complete set. Exactly. So the new stuff is in that as is the old stuff. Yeah, so there's, um, if you look at the table of contents at the front, there is the section entitled New Construction and Additions of Historic Built to Historic Buildings. So the residential, commercial, and mixed use construction on large sites corresponds to the least restrictive uh, standards that do not have to be based on model example. The residential, commercial, and mixed use construction with historic context is that kind of step down, medi median kind of standard that requires. Still requires a historic model example, but doesn't require kind of replication. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, um, new residential construction based on a historic model example is that are those tight infill sites that require pretty much a replication of a historic structure, at least on all street visible facades. Got it. And there's a standard neighborhood committee that keeps track of the historic district and participated in forming the Standards. Exactly. They've been meeting with our staff intensively over the last probably year, I would say, to devise the standards. I would just like to make the suggestion in the future for something like this to be helpful for us for reviewing to see what the new stuff is versus the old stuff. Like I, yeah, just highlight or in bold or something so that we know what we're looking at would be, be useful. As Dan knows, he works for me. Dan? <laughs> My the only other question would be so, and maybe Randy can answer this too since he, he looked over this at the preservation board. So, what sort of restrictions are there for this new? Is it solely just like facade treatments, or for the, the large sites without historic context? Well, the um, virtually all of our historic district standards throughout the city in our 17 historic and landmark districts deal with exteriors only. Okay. Um, none of them deal with interior design aspects, um, uh, whether it's a historic building or a new building, uh, because the thought is that there's a public interest in what you can see from the street. Right. There isn't a public interest in, you know, living rooms and dining rooms and, <laughs> and someone's private. <laughs> the, um, the, there are additional standards when it comes to things like a screening for parking lots, um, and and there's a section on sidewalks when there's new construction that they have to be either exposed aggregate or brick pavers, because in some parts of Lafayette Square you have brick pavers, and it would be really odd to have a brick paver, brick paver, brick paver, and then concrete, and then more brick pavers for your sidewalk. Um, so there's some site requirements for it, uh, but most of the requirements deal with the exterior design of buildings um, and such. And the new construction area also? Yes. And the general feel is that this site, because to me it seems like it's fairly separated from the rest of what you would consider additional Lafayette Square, that it warrants having that additional overlay for that <coughs> facade requirements? Well, the the Lafayette Square boundaries were increased over time to include just the, the most simple dimensions of Shoto, Jefferson, the highway, and um, I believe Dolman or Truman Parkway. So, um, you know, I do not believe there was much discussion, if any, of changing the boundaries or where the district began or ended. Lafayette Square is very invested in being a historic district, and they're they think they have a tremendous asset in the ability to regulate development through the historic district standards, even if it's areas that are largely undeveloped or underdeveloped or will change significantly. I think reading between the lines there is, is at one time the protection mechanism of putting up the boundaries a little further was hoped to occur. Uh, those industrial uses uh, were a real problem. They one, one blew up. Two, we converted them to out of, <laughs> of zoning to out of out of uh, J zoning, and so having these using the historic district to have some design guidelines in that area, uh, without, instead of shrinking the, the historic district boundaries, putting a sort of a, 
a customized, lighter version of design standards was another way to get a little clout to make sure it fits into what they overall expect to happen. With that, the recommended action is to approve the work, revise uh, Lafayette Square's standard district as attached. And, and as I said, it's both a, in compliance with the needs of being compliant with the institutional land use plan and with the land use and with the neighborhood. Is that moved and seconded? Oh, can we roll call the vote, please? Oops. Uh, Commissioner Barron? Nay. Uh, Mr. Bradley? Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Peoples. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Commissioner Young. Aye. And Chair Strother. Aye. And motion passes with six ayes and one minute. So uh, you have one more action item tonight? Yes, the brief one that Ron will give you. Uh, so I just take the floor for a second. Uh, obviously, you can see the delegated items that are here. You can ask us about them afterwards if you like. Um, I'm going to also want to make one concluding remark after one just the news item. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, this resolution uh, basically requests the approval of the planning commission to conduct a presentation and a public hearing at a future planning commission meeting, and that would be for amendment number 18 of the city's strategic plan use plan. Or as we call it, uh, strategic land use plan was most recently uh, uh, amended two years or so ago as amendment number 17. That was done for a um, in response to a, a change in vision for a large industrial site um, on the Hill neighborhood. Uh, as many of you know, that site is currently being uh, redeveloped for residential purposes. Uh, in contrast, Amendment Number 18 um, is going to be a general update that will have multiple sites located throughout the city. Uh, the uh, proposed changes will be based on three criteria. Uh, these are action items that were previously approved by the Planning Commission over the last couple of years, uh, development projects that have been completed on those sites, as well as uh, some incremental development projects that have occurred over time. Um, but simply, uh, this resolution is just requesting your approval to have that presentation and public hearing um, occur at a future meeting that will likely be next meeting in, in January. And uh, if approved, we'll take care of all of the uh, requirements in order to have that public hearing take place. And a simple way to look at it, it's, it's our annual update of the strategic land use plan that was staffing shortfalls annual. This is our big check mark that was again up to date. And it's called for a public meeting, public hearing. That's correct. Any questions? Any action? We'll move and second it. Call for previous roll. Any objection? Uh, no, I don't think you want to. Oh. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Van. Aye. Mr. Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Mr. People. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Commissioner Young. Aye. And Chair Strother. Aye. Motion passes. Call for voting on. So I will make one thing is you, you're welcome to peruse anything else here that you would like to inquire us about. Cecilia or myself or Roman. Um, happy to do that, but I'm going to make one note that on uh, December 19th, uh, there will be a proposal put before the Board of Estimate and Development to increase the planning and urban design budget by $1.6 million, uh, which we're pretty happy to see. Um, and that is going to come from what we affectionately call the eco Depot tax. Uh, that was, so it will, be, it will be this year's budget request. There will be ongoing funding for it, and we'll continue it for the years to come. Uh, the only slight drawback to my being excited about $1.6 million is I have to give $1 million of it to the St. Louis Development Corporation. But the, but the $600,000... Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it is back rent. But for, for them to do uh, a couple projects, uh, including a comprehensive economic development plan. But uh, our 610 will be focused on starting a more robust neighborhood plan. Uh, we used to do those uh, fairly regularly when we had funding to help with them. Now they've been, the Gravoy plan had some of our involvement, high's involvement, some philosophy. This will now be, we'll be able to put the program together. So that's pretty exciting. 
right away um, vacation. Does the city get compensated for that? No. So we just give land away to the Well, so so it's so I'll I'll do the quick thing. Uh, in Illinois it doesn't happen. You, you have to pay. But the principle is and Rich will re, will refresh me. It's it's a right of way vacation. So at the time of the creation of the abutting lots, those lots gave to city gave to the city the use of what's become the street as a right of way easement. When we're closing them, the, the, at the center line, it reverts back to the abutting parcel holders on each side. Okay. And so we don't charge it. There's a maintenance cost on that, by the way. Okay. So we actually, in other words, if it's a anymore, or the case, there is a reverse benefit <laughs> eventually. But seems like there should be a meeting. We, we, well, yeah. no, you're, you're right. We have this conversation. We give away a lot less now than what had happened in the past. We're very protective about that. And, I, and I'd like to find a way to a way to, to charge them, but it's it's that vacating our use of a right-of-way is what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. With that, before we dismiss, first let me say I hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving. I wish everybody a happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Holiday, just a good vacation if you're on it, whatever you are whatever you are on. Uh, and with that, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, January the seventh. Um, I'm afraid. Yeah. 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 No, that will be sent out, and I'm sure we check to be sure there won't be blue part. Well, if there he is. <laughs> we're, we're gonna, uh, I'll tell you what is that we're we're juggling that so you're not meeting the Wednesday after after the first. And second is the aldermen are having a shortened session this year and we need to get some items passed before Tuesday the 9th, up to Tuesday the 10th. Uh, so that we're going to be on the 9th. We're going to check as to what's going on with the Blues game. We might ask you to meet at 4 o'clock. No Blues game. No Blues game. Oh. Good. Good. <laughs> All right. Good. Hold it. Let's back up because something you said. The ninth is a Wednesday. The ninth, sorry, the ninth was the ninth was when we originally told you we've now moved it back to the seventh. Because we have to we have to meet by prior to the eighth. Okay. All right. No problem with that. Um, with that, any other questions? Any other comments? Any business? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Sorry, you know, we had a good night. Merry Christmas.